Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming here. Uh, my name is Konstantin Serebrny. This is my co-speaker, Dmitry Vyukov. Uh, we are both from Google, uh, from Moscow. Uh, and we'll be talking today about uh, two bug detection tools and a little bit of uh, how to apply them to, to kernel. So first bug detection tool we want to, to tell you about is called address sanitizer. It finds memory errors uh, and currently works for, us uh, for user space. Uh, programs. Uh, the second tool is called Thread Sanitizer. It finds data races also in user space programs. Uh, after we tell you about these two tools, we'll uh, tell you some, uh, some of our thoughts about applying these tools for, to the kernel. And uh, at the end, we will uh, share some of our requests to the kernel and to the Linux distributions uh, to make these tools better. So, address sanitizer. Uh, the beauty of C++ comes with a lot of different, different kinds of bugs. Uh, probably the, the, the nastiest uh, bugs are buffer overflows and use after freeze, but there are quite a few other kinds of memory bugs that uh, you don't want to have in, in your program. Uh, let me give a brief overview of the tool that we have. Uh, the, the tool is, uh, uh, is um, using compile time instrumentation, uh, which is more or less platform independent. Uh, and it also has a runtime library which currently supports uh, Linux, uh, OS X, Android, which is a flavor of Linux, and Windows. Uh, the Linux support is, is the, the best uh, among other platforms. Uh, the tool has been released in May 2011. Uh, in, in November 2011, it has become a part of LVM distribution. Uh, and just recently, uh, around a month ago, it has become a part of GCC distribution, starting from uh, 4.8. Uh, let, let's start from, from, from some examples. Uh, how, do you, how do we use this tool? Uh, suppose you have a program, and here is a four-line four C program that has a global, uh, global array, and uh, the program is accessing this array out of bounds. Uh, in red, you see the buggy part of the code. Uh, you compile this program as you do usually, but uh, you add one extra command line option. And you simply run this program as you usually do. Uh, uh, if the bug is found, uh, the warning message will be printed to STDR or to, to some other file if you, if you change options. And it will show you uh, the type of bug. It says global buffer overflow here. It will, it will show you a stack trace where the, the bad access happens. And it will give you some more information. In, in this case, it says that the uh, memory access is four bytes to the right of the global and it gives the name of the global and some addresses. Uh, some more examples. Uh, the tool is also capable of finding stack buffer overflows. Uh, this is a similar case. We have a stack, bu stack buffer and we access it out of bounds. Uh, yet uh, again, the tool shows the stack trace and now it shows the complete stack frame of, uh, of the function and uh, where the memory access happened. In this case, we see that uh, the array ends at 432, and the access wa was at 436 bytes. Uh, next example is heap buffer overflow. Uh, you have a buffer allocated by new or by malloc or whatever else, and you again are accessing it out of bounds. Uh, very similar situation, but now it shows you uh, where the allocation has happened. And this is probably one of the most frequent uh, bug types we find. It's use after free. Uh, you allocate heap memory, you deallocate heap memory, and you, then you access it. Uh, so in this case, the tool finds you uh, where the bad access happened. It also shows you, shows you where the memory has been deallocated and where it has been allocated before that. So how does this work? Uh, first, let us 
let us know that if we take any, any aligned eight bytes of the application, uh, they have only nine states with regard to addressability. Uh, first, uh, n bytes are good, and the rest, eight minus n bytes are bad. This gives us the just nine different states. And uh, there are no other states because uh, malloc uh, always returns eight aligned memory, and you can align your stack at global memory by eight. So just nine states. And uh, since nine is less than two, 256, you can encode the state in just one byte. And we call this, uh, this information byte, this, uh, this metadata, uh, we call it shadow byte. And this picture shows how we encode uh, the, the shadow. If all bytes of the eight byte word are good, the shadow byte is zero. And there are other values that, that show that, that, that there are bad bytes in, in, in the eight byte word. Uh, we, we store shadow in, in a se separate portion of the address space. Uh, this example shows you a typical 32-bit address space on Linux, uh, where the application uh, uses a little bit uh, at the bottom and uh, a lot of the address space at the top. So uh, we take uh, one-eighth of the address space in, in the middle. Uh, we say that two parts uh, belong to the shadow memory, and the mapping is very simple. Uh, you simply shift the application address by three and add a constant offset. Uh, so this way you get a mapping between every eight bytes of application uh, and one byte of shadow. Uh, this mapping causes uh, one portion of address space to be completely unused, so we am protected just in case. Uh, pretty simple. Uh, it actually can get uh, a little bit simpler. Uh, if you build uh, with dash PIE on Linux, uh, you get uh, all of the application addresses uh, at the uh, higher parts of address space. So you don't need the bottom. And this gives us even simpler uh, mapping, which is just shift the address by three. One instruction. Uh, so what, what do we do in compiler? When compiler sees uh, some memory access, whether it's a read or write, it doesn't matter. Uh, it computes the address of shadow by shifting and maybe adding an offset. Uh, then it reads this shadow just one byte. And if this byte is non-zero, it means there is a bug and we, we report it. And then, f then the original memory access follows. This example is for eight byte access. And for uh, smaller accesses, the, the instrumentation is just uh, four instructions more. But these instructions are very cheap, just arithmetic. Uh, let me give you an example of assembly, which is generated by the compiler. Uh, this time, this is x86-64, uh, where two works perfectly as well. So the, the original address is an RDI. Uh, we move it to another register. We shift the, that register by three. Uh, then we simultaneously add an offset, load the byte, and compare it with zero. This is magic of x86. We, we can do it in one instruction. If the result was not zero, we jump to, uh, to a place where we call uh, error handler. And then we, uh, then we uh, run the, the original instruction. Very simple, very fast. Uh, in order to find uh, bugs like buffer overflows, uh, we need to create so-called red zones around the buffers. So such that when you hit the red zone, uh, it actually has uh, some non-zero shadow value and the, uh, the report will happen. So what, what do we do with stack? Uh, suppose we have some stack variable in a function. Uh, the compiler inserts red zones around, uh, around this variable. Uh, it inserts a 32-byte red zone at the left, and then it inserts a um, red zone at the right, 
so that it's 32 bytes plus alignment up to 32 bytes. Uh, then, in, in the very beginning of the function, it uh, puts uh, poisoned values in the in the shadow. Uh, this fffff means that we poison the whole 32 byte uh, region, and this many f's and two zeros means that we poisoned 24 bytes and left unpoisoned eight bytes. Uh, then the original code follows, and then we unpoison. Uh, the the shadow before the function edit. So as you can see, uh, we spent just like uh, six store instructions uh, for for every function to to make it poison. Of course, if there are more more stack variables, it gets more. Uh, we do the same for globals. We do it as program startup, and the the runtime library uh, does this for heap. Uh, when when a user uh, asks n bytes, it actually allocates n bytes plus something and poisons the, the red zones. Very simple. Uh, the runtime library also collects uh, stack traces, delays the reuse of read memory, and does some other bookkeeping. Uh, so this this is a good uh, part. Uh, you probably many of you probably have heard. Uh, to find bugs uh, where M memset uh, touches bad memory. Uh, yes, the, the question was, uh, why do we need to in intercept memset function? Uh, if memset function touches memory which it shouldn't touch, uh, we will find it. Uh, if we don't intercept memset, we'll not find it because we're compiling instrumentation and memset sits in the libc code. And we, we actually have quite a few interceptors, like maybe maybe 100. Mm. The, the good thing about this tool is performance. It is insanely fast. Uh, on spec 2006, it shows on average less than two times slowdown. Uh, and this is fair comparison, O2 versus O2 pl plus at the same time. Uh, on most GUI applications like Chrome, and this is I'm presenting from, from Chrome now, uh, you will not see uh, any slowdown typically because GUI applications don't don't require all of the CPU. Uh, on on server side applications, we typically see f uh, from 50% to 3x slowdown, and this is O2 versus O2. Uh, memory overhead of the tool comes from many many different sources, uh, but typical the overall overhead is between two times and three times compared to the regular run. So this is uh, one of my favorite slides. These are trophies. Uh, in the first two months, uh, in the first 10 months uh, of testing Chrome with this tool, uh, we found about 300 bugs, uh, 200 use of to freeze and uh, 100 of different buffer overflows. Uh, now it is almost two years that we're testing Chrome with address sanitizer. And I think we already found more than 1,000 bugs in Chrome and in, in other libraries. Uh, besides Chrome, our users found bugs in Mozilla, I guess more than 100 already. And basically everywhere else uh, we, we or someone else applied this tool. Of course, we're also testing Google's, Google server-side uh, applications with this tool and uh, perhaps a couple of thousand uh, bugs found already. Uh, there is some future work we want to do. Uh, want to do some static analysis uh, to uh, to avoid instrumenting uh, safe uh, memory accesses to make the tool even faster. Uh, we want to instrument or recompile the libraries so that we find bugs in, in any library code, not just memset. We want to, to learn how to instrument inline assembler if, if your program has one, because currently we don't we don't handle inline assembler. I mean the program will work, but it will not find bugs if they appear in, in, in assembly code. And finally, we want to adapt uh, this tool to use it in kernel, to find bugs in the kernel. And this part we will discuss later in this talk. So uh, as a summary of this tool, C++ has suddenly become a much better, a, a, a much safer language. And you're welcome to use this tool. Uh, 
One tool we will not be talking today is memory sanitizer, which uh, finds uses of uninitialized memory. It sort of, uh, uh, if you combine address sanitizer and memory sanitizer, you get functionality of Valgrind, but 20 times faster. The tool we will be talking today is thread sanitizer, and I am giving the, the word to my co-speaker. <coughs> Hi. Uh, so thread sanitizer is data race detector for C, C++, and the Go language. Uh, so what is data race? Data race occurs when two threads access the same variable concurrently, and at least one of the accesses is the right. Uh, so here you see a simple program with the data race, and you also just need to add the f sanitized equals thread flag to the compiler. And below you see an example of the report. We uh, describe the two racy memory accesses, uh, print the stack traces for them, and uh, describe the involved threads, print stack traces, and also describe the mutexes that were held during the memory access. Uh, so we've started working on the thread sanitizer back in 2009, but it is now what we call thread sanitizer version one. It was based on the Valgrind and it was very slow. Like 20X was a <coughs> typical slowdown and sometimes it was uh, like more than 400X. Uh, sorry. But we still found uh, thousands of races with it and it, that time it was faster than other <coughs> tools. Uh, so about a year ago we started working on Thread Sanitizer version 2 which is also based on the compiler instrumentation instead of Valgrind and we completely redesigned the runtime library so now it's fully parallel. Uh, there is no uh, mutexes or extensive atomic operations on the fast path and it scales to really huge applications. It has better and more predictable memory footprint and also prints very informative reports. Uh, so here's, here's some performance numbers. Uh, this is our server side application. The RPC benchmark is a, a highly parallel throughput benchmark and there's some typical server application test and stream defill test is a very simple single threaded test. Uh, so there you see that slowdown of uh, thread sanitizer one is like 25, 40 and on the RPC benchmark it's more than 400x and for Tsun 2 uh, the slowdown is about 2 or 4x which is much much more acceptable and uh, much faster. So the, the compiler instrumentation is very simple. Uh, we just insert the function calls into the runtime library to intercept the interesting event. So we insert uh, function calls uh, in function and try before function exit and before each memory access we insert the callback which says uh, whether it's a read, write, the size of the memory access and pass the address. And we also intercept the, the atomic operations uh, in the compiler model. Um, so thread sanitizer also uses the shadow memory and also the simple Zerg mapping, uh, which is very similar to address sanitizer. Uh, so currently it requires dash pi flag, uh, so that all application memory is at, at the top of the address space, and the um, the shadow mapping is, is similar, we just need like two uh, arithmetic instructions. Um, so the shadow is more complex, it consists of so-called shadow cells. Each cell is eight bytes and it represents one, uh, describes one previous memory access to the application memory. Um, so there is 16 bits for thread ID uh, 42 bits for epoch or a scalar clock when the memory access was done and five bits describe the size and position in eight byte application block and one bit is says whether it's read or write. So the, uh, all the information is in, in the shadow cell is completely embedded. 
Um, then for, um, for each eight bytes of application memory that you see on the left, uh, we have four such uh, shadow cells that describe uh, up to four previous memory accesses to, to that eight bytes of application memory. Um, so let's consider a simple example. Um, so initially all shadow cells are empty and then thread one makes a write to the first two bytes. Um, since the shadow is empty, we just remember in the first slot the thread ID, its clock, and the size position and that it's a write. Uh, then thread two makes a read of the last four bytes. So we remember that information and we check uh, the, the existing cells to, to find potential races. So in this case, they do not race because they touch different memory. And then um, thread three makes a read of the first four bytes. So we store that information and check the previous memory access. So it does not race with the second memory access because both are reads. But it can potentially race with the first access because uh, so they are from different threads. At least one of them is the write and they, they access the same memory. So now we need to answer the question uh, whether there is a data race or not. And so we need to check whether they are synchronized or not or whether they run concurrently. So and for this, we use the so-called happens before relation. Uh, so uh, <coughs> I won't describe in, in the details how we exactly calculate this, but this is a constant time operation. We just need to extract the thread ID and the clock from the shadow memory and load make one load from thread local storage and <coughs> make one compare, so it's very fast. Uh, so when, when all shadow cells are full um, and we need to store a new memory access, sometimes we can replace one of the previous memory accesses without losing any useful information. Uh, but if it's not possible, we just replace the random cell with, with a new memory access. <coughs> So when we find a data race, we print the report and it contains two stack traces for the current memory access and for the previous memory access. And current stack trace, it's easy. You just need to unwind the, the stack. But the previous memory uh, stack trace is kind of problematic because uh, when we handle memory access, we don't know if it will race with some future memory access or not. And it means that we need to remember um, full stack traces for all memory accesses in the application. Um, and to remember the stack traces, we use the perfect cyclic buffer of events. Um, so events are memory accesses, function and try exit and mutex lock unlock. Each event is 64 bits, three bits for type, and 61 bits is for program counter or associated address. Um, so when we need to restore the stack trace, uh, we just replay this buffer from beginning to the, to the memory access, and while we replay, we model the state of the, of the stack. And when we reach the, the interest in memory access, we get the, the stack trace for for this memory access. And similarly, we get the uh, set of mutexes that were held during the, the memory access. So this replay is slow, but it's done only when we report the race, so it's uh, not relevant. But it's very fast to add to this stack trace. We just need to increment the position and store one word into the trace. Um, and also has the predictable memory footprint. Uh, but since the buffer is cyclic, we lost the information after some time. So by default, we hold 128,000 events per thread, which is roughly, roughly 1,000, oh, sorry, 128,000 uh, previous memory accesses for each thread. So we also have 
function interceptors for more than 100 functions like malloc, free, pfred, mutex, something pfred, create, destroy, and so on for memory copy and also for read, write, open. And for example, due to this, we can find races and file descriptors when, for example, you uh, write the file and concurrently close the, the file descriptor. Um, so what are our headaches? Uh, it is timeouts, so the programs are still slower, so some typically server applications uh, sometimes trigger some timeouts, usually we just increase the timeouts. Uh, so it's memory consumption, uh, sometimes programs get killed due to out of memory. Uh, also, we have problems with non-instrumented libraries, especially if uh, we miss some synchronization on atomic variables, for example, in uh, non-instrumented libraries. And the, the last thing is uh, so-called benign data races. Uh, it's, it's when you like increment some counter without any synchronization and you think that it's okay. Uh, yeah, the, the threat synthesizer complains about such things as well. Okay, um, now I move to address synthesizer for Linux kernel. Um, so we are not kernel hackers at all, and uh, currently we only have very early proof of concept of the tool, so it's more about what, what we want to do. Uh, so what is currently there? There is config debug slab, uh, which uh, adds red zones and poisoning to the kernel memory blocks. It can detect some out of bounds and use after free, but uh, it does not detect out of bound reads. And the use after free detection is kind of best effort. Uh, there is kmem check, uh, which triggers page and fault on every memory access and just uh, simulates the memory access. Uh, so it's kind of finds, I think, most of the bugs, but it's very slow due to page and faults. Uh, there is also debug page alloc, which unmaps uh, the freed pages from address space. So it can find uh, use after free, but only if a uh, whole page is freed. Uh, so there are also some static analysis tools, but they're kind of complementary to the dynamic tools. And there are some uh, experimental or academic tools, but as far as I understand that I know they are not in the widespread use. So uh, what we want to do is config ASEN, which is intended to be fast and comprehensive solution for use of the free and out of bounds box. So it's based on the compiler instrumentation, so it will be fast. Uh, so it can find out of bounds for both reads and writes. Uh, it provides strong use of the free detection due to delayed reuse of memory. And it uh, detects uh, the bad memory access promptly, right when they happen. It also provides the informative reports with stack traces for when you, uh, where you're located read the memory block and so on. Uh, so this is, this is our ideas on, on how to implement this. So uh, on top you see the virtual address space in the kernel. Uh, there is a user part and the kernel part. And in the kernel part there is so-called physical memory region. Uh, so in the one, we want to place the shadow memory into the physical memory region at the constant offset, for example, 64 max or something. And the size of the shadow region will be one eighth of the, of the physical memory. So then the calculation, the shadow mapping is very similar to user space. So we need to check that the address belongs to the physical memory range, uh, and then also just divide by eight and add uh, an add offset. <coughs> uh, so there's also virtual memory. And uh, for now, it's unclear what's the best way to handle it. Uh, because uh, 
So ideally we want the mapping for the shadow memory to be just uh, divide by eight and add an offset without any additional branching or something. Um, so, uh, so we want to start with the slab allocator uh, and add red zones and poison and poison them and uh, add the delay reuse of the memory blocks to find the use of the free box. Um, so the, the API that the ASEN will provide is uh, Simul is looks like this. There is a function to poison the memory region and poison the memory region and check the addressability of the memory region. So with this, this API, we want to intercept, uh, instrument the memset, memcompare function, and so on, and probably some other memory allocators in the kernel. Uh, so here is the problem that we know about. Uh, so the, we need to find a way to do the fast shadow memory mapping. Uh, we need to figure out what to do with the bootstrap process because we can't turn off the instrumentation due to performance considerations. Uh, so there also will be some text size increase um, and there may most likely will be some problems with interrupts. Uh, especially if we want to re print a report from the interrupt. And there may be some problems with modulus, for example, like uh, if, if the module is not instrumented or instrumented with the wrong version of the address synthesizer. And most likely there are a lot more problems. Uh, and so, yeah, the, so potentially we can also implement the thread synthesizer, but it's much more challenging uh, because address synthesizer need to intercept, uh, it need to intercept some memory management function and some memory accesses. So if it does not in, in intercept some other memory accesses, it just won't report the box there, but <clears throat> Fred synthesizer need to intercept all synchronization, absolutely. Otherwise, it will report uh, false false positives. Um, so, and uh, the main issue that we see there it, uh, this probably will be the with the atomic memory operations in the kernel. So, in user space, when we rely on the C C11 like uh, atomic operations, where uh, you also have uh, where, where you have the, the address of the atomic access. You see that this is an atomic access, and you also have the associated memory ordering, like a query release. Uh, but in the kernel, as far as I understand, it's usually expressed just like a plain memory access, and then there is a like write or read memory barrier, and there is no way to figure out what exactly this memory barrier intended to synchronize. Uh, yeah, so, and now I'm giving the word to, to Kostya. Thank you. So, uh, as we told, uh, the, the tools work perfectly, well, w very well at least for, for user space, but they could work even better with some of the help from, uh, from the Linux kernel and distributions actually mostly from the kernel. So uh, the ideal address space layout for these tools is when all of the application memory is somewhere in one place. Either it's at the very bottom or at the very top. We don't care. Uh, the, the, the simplest thing is when everything is at the uh, highest one-eighth of the address space, if this is 64-bit, uh, of course. Uh, so this is from uh, seven O zeros to seven F F F F F, and today we actually achieve this ideal address space layout on Linux. If this is x eighty six sixty four, if this is P I E, if address space layout randomization is enabled, and if the stack uh, size is limited, and this is what we use for T S N, and this is what we prefer to use for A S N. Uh, ideally, we would have uh, we would have this uh, space layout always. 
Uh, as Bill Gates said in 1981, uh, 16 terabytes of address space should be enough for anybody. Uh, say it again, sorry. We, we, we didn't see any slowdown. It, it, it's around noise. May, maybe 1%. Yeah, there's definitely a peak, peak uh, th this is not peak, this is pi. So pi is less yeah. expensive than peak. And on the programs, we, 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 we tried to measure this penalty, and we didn't see it. Uh, and some programs are already built with Pi by default, like Chrome is built with Pi by default, so there is no difference at all. A uh, little bit more, more uh, like complain about address space uh, with uh, address space layout randomization off. So if you, if you take uh, a, a C program that prints an address of main uh, and if you build it with, uh, if you build it with Pi, uh, on on the recent Ubuntu, it will print something like five 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 five, and this is with uh, ASLR off. And on the on the older Ubuntu, you will s you will see like something like seven FFF, and we like this seven FFF much mm. much more. Uh, so this this actually means for us that uh, TSN. A threat sanitizer cannot work with random uh, with ASLR off. For example, if you run it in GDB, you have to explicitly disable it so that you can run TSAN. And this is for for us, it is a serious regression uh, between Ubuntu 10 and Ubuntu 12. We know actually the guilty commit, uh, and we would like to find someone to to explain us. Do you really need this, folks? Uh, another problem is unlimited stack which is really too greedy. Uh, today, if you run a program with ulimit-s unlimited, uh, it will actually uh, allocate 84 terabytes of address space for stack. Do you, do you need that much? I don't think so. Uh, so this, this is one, mm, this is another uh, complaint. Uh, it also causes us some trouble with TSAN because we, we cannot run TSAN in a setting where stack stack is unlimited. And for some unknown reason, uh, GNU make sets stack to unlimited. So if you run TSAN from make, it will not work unless we do something tricky. Uh, this, this is not a complaint, this is a request. Uh, we, we run these uh, tools in, in a memory, in a memory uh, limited settings, like uh, we want to run many, many tests on a single virtual machine uh, where they compete for memory. And since the tools uh, take more memory than the regular run, uh, they sometimes uh, like require more memory than there is available. Uh, and then the, the process just dies uh, due to out of memory. Uh, the, the, simple, the, the good thing about the tools is that uh, all three tools uh, are designed in this way that the shadow value zero means it's okay. There is no bug there, it, it, it's a good memory. So uh, if, we could, uh, if we could give uh, these shadow pages to the kernel when it is close to out of memory, uh, such that uh, when, when we need it back, when we need this page back, uh, it comes either with the old uh, state or with all zeros. This would be perfect. And uh, this, this is a little bit similar to M advice uh, don't need, but not exactly equivalent. So there's a patch for this, but you get a signal. You get a signal. You have to ignore the signal. We can ignore the signal. It, it, it's fine. Uh, we've seen something very similar as, as F advice volatile. Uh, somewhere in the patches, but this is not, not in the main kernel. So uh, this is something we, we want very much uh, to, to make the tools more, uh, more stable in the presence of, of, of strict memory limit. So there's another advantage that you mark it. You can't tell the VM that it discusses pages first, the broader pages. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
We actually don't want it to we don't want uh, the VM to discard these pages first. Okay. We want VM to discard these pages last. Oh, yeah, then it won't. Yeah, if we want to make it, we talked about this yesterday at lunchtime. But what we really want is MNBI wants but don't need, which is don't evict the pages if you don't have to, but if you do, get rid of them because we're interested in the data. But if you need them, take them away because uh, zero page is fine for us, and it helps. Uh, again, this uh, this is required for for the tools to run in the memory limited environment. Otherwise, uh, the tools work uh, well today. Uh, also, uh, one of our requests is how to limit the the memory of the application running under these tools. ASAN address sanitizer uses 20 terabytes of memory. TSAN uses 97 terabytes of memory, uh, of virtual memory, of course, and memory sanitizer uses 72 terabytes. Uh, in, in, in this setting, uh, U limit dash V is useless. You, you, cannot, you cannot say, I, I want to use like 73 terabytes of memory. Uh, it will not work. So uh, we need some way to limit the real memory for the process. Maybe the containers will help us. I'm not sure. Uh, but I guess we're not, the, we're not the only guys who want this uh, functionality in the kernel. Uh, Another problem is general robustness in the presence of uh, large M-mapped regions. So all of the three tools uh, map their shadow memory with M-map no reserve flag, which means that we, we allocate these many terabytes of memory, but we are not actually using all of them. Uh, and unfortunately, in the current state, Linux is very unstable if you are actually starting to use all of those 20 terabytes or 40 terabytes. Uh, there, there was a, a bug with mlock all, uh, which caused the machine to hang. If you, if, you, if you first allocate 20 terabytes and then you say mlock all, machine dies. Uh, this bug has been recently fixed about a couple of months ago in the, uh, in, in the trunk. And we still see uh, problems uh, if you just start using that memory too much. Uh, more most usually this is either a bug in our tool or some very serious bug in, in the user code uh, which triggers these, these hangs. Uh, but still, I think that the kernel should not be dying uh, on, on such conditions. Uh, one of our uh, requests to the Linux distributions. Uh, so. All of these three tools are very good at finding bugs in, in user code, but sometimes uh, a user may call a library code, like maybe libc or maybe things like gtk or qt or whatever, and that library will access uh, some uh, freed memory, for example. So there is, this is not a bug in, in the library, this is a bug in user code which calls library code on incorrect pointer. But our tools will not find it because the library code is not instrumented. Uh, which is worse for, for TSAN, uh, if the library is using atomic synchronization uh, and we don't see it, uh, we will see false, uh, false positives, false positive reports. So uh, the best solution we can, we can think of is to ship instrumented libraries with Linux distributions. Or maybe to, to have some automated way to, uh, to build them uh, from scratch if needed. And I'm afraid this, uh, this has to be done o on per distro basis, or at least like uh, it has to be done one way for RPM, one way for Debian packages, one way for anything else, whatever. Uh, so let me summarize uh, our talk. Uh, address sanitizer finds buffer overflows used after free bugs in your C++ code. Uh, it's very fast, very robust, and we believe it's a must-have for all C++ developers. And this is actually already like this in Google. Uh, more or less uh, all of the C++ code is tested with address sanitizer. Uh, thread sanitizer finds data races, uh, not just in C++ but also in the Go language. 
Uh, so if you're using one of those languages and you have threads, this is a must have for you, I believe so. Uh, both tools are possible for the, uh, to, to, uh, for the kernel. Uh, TSAN is a little bit more tricky because of these atomic synchronization issues. Uh, we are currently in the investigation stage and help is more than welcome. Uh, if we get some uh, support from the kernel and uh, Linux distributions, the tool will become even more awesome. Uh, uh, both tools, well, actually all three tools are open source. Uh, ASAN and TSAN are, parts, uh, are part of both LLVM and GCC uh, distributions, and MSAN is a new tool which is currently only in, in LLVM. Uh, thanks a lot, and we are ready to take questions. Uh, the question about ARM architecture, uh, yes, uh, these tools can work on this device. Uh, we do uh, have regular process of uh, running uh, Chrome tests for Android on the Android device. No virtual machine, just, just a plain device. Uh, uh, we, we know that someone has tried uh, ASAN on uh, Ubuntu for ARM, but we ourselves didn't do it. So it is known to work on Ubuntu ARM. Yes. When we free memory in ASAN, uh, we need to mark the shadow for the freed memory as poisoned. We don't need to touch the, the actual memory. And uh, since the shadow is uh, 8 to 1, it is compact, we actually need to memset uh, w much, much less memory than the actually uh, deallocated chunk. It, it, it is a fast operation. I perhaps missed it. How do you detect a uh, write outside of a, a reference outside of an uh, area using the shadow memory? Yeah, so th th there are red zones or like... Uh, uh, if, you, if you have a region, either, the, either global or stack or heap buffer, uh, around it we have uh, poisoned areas. Uh, they are typically like something like 32 bytes uh, on each side. For large heap locations, they are larger. So if you, if you access uh, one byte out of bounds or like 10 bytes out of bounds, you hit the red zone and it is poisoned. If you jump like one kilobyte out of bounds, uh, you may be unlucky and you may hit uh, in other locations, so the bug will not be detected. Uh, but the red zones are adaptive, so if you have a large heap block, the red zone will also be large. Yes, we, we b before we actually read the uh, memory location, we also read the shadow of the memory location. We cannot detect all of the wild pointer references, uh, but the way our locator is uh, made, we actually do find a lot of wild references just, just due to uh, we, we, we sort of increase the probability of finding while, while the references. Is, is the Go uh, thread sanitizer like the data race detector the same as the algorithm? The one that's yes, uh, so the question is about the Go thread sanitizer. So the algorithm is essentially the same. We have maybe a few defines in the runtime library. Uh, for Go, because, for example, Go is a uh, type-safe language, so we don't need to store the size of the memory access. So the, the first byte, byte identifies the variable. And we also have uh, some different constants, for example, for max count of threads, because um, Go routines in Go are might much lighter weight, so there can be more of them. But so in the, the compiler instrumentation is, is done in the Go compiler, but uh, otherwise it's the same.
thank you for the questions. If you have more, we're here the, for the rest of the day, and we will be happy to answer more questions. Thank you.